Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. The way we design our models is that we design them so that they can, those algorithms can, shape those particular nuances between markets, but that they have a common structure and have common constraints and common features across markets that we know, in some sense, hold economic value or have some economic truth to them. So Rob, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Katie and I are very excited to have you here. We really appreciate you taking time out to do this. Now, your firm has an interesting story. There's an interesting sort of history behind it. And I was hoping that maybe we could start off there, but just you talking a little bit about the, the background of uh, Alpha Simplex. Sure. Be happy to, Niels. And thank you for having me on your show. So Alpha Simplex is not a name that, at least a couple years ago, most people thought of. You could think of us a little bit as one of the later comers to manage futures, but we were, you know, right there in the thick of it for the quantitative firms that started in the 90s. Like many other managers, we got our start and got most of our early funding as a consultancy rather than a manager or asset manager. It was only, and then we did everything from tactical asset allocation, risk models, even trading or algorithmic execution models. It wasn't until about 2003 that we began running assets under the name Alpha Simplex. And it wasn't really until around 2007, 2008, when we were acquired by Natixis, that we really started having the amount of distribution and the, the relative exposure that we're experiencing today. So, Rob, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your path into managed futures, a little bit more about your background and how you ended up where you are today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, that's, that's well over a decade ago now. Uh, it, it's kind of a funny story. I, I, when I first heard of Alpha Simplex, it was a much, much smaller firm. And I heard it from two different places. I heard it from uh, one of my professors at the time, a gentleman named John Campbell. He runs uh, Arrow Street Advisors, a uh, fairly well-known fundamental shop these days. And I found out from a friend also from, who used to be the president of the ballroom dance team at my university. It's kind of funny. I went to Harvard, but the, the thing that was most important about my stay there was actually the ballroom dance team. That's where I met my wife, and it's also where I got my position at Alpha Simplex. And it was a decision at the time between Alpha Simplex and Google. And Google was, you know, the tremendous tech firm we all know and some of us love today. And Alpha Simplex was this new entrepreneurial very research-focused organization. And I couldn't resist the pull of both that opportunity, but also the chance of you know, really working with a small, tight-knit group of individuals who are focused more on the research, focused more on understanding the markets than necessarily just making money. And that's what really first appealed to me about Alpha Simplex. Now, the culture at Alpha Simplex is a little bit distinct. And I, I mentioned before it's a research group, and that's, that's how it started. It was founded by Andrew Lowe and, a, in effect, a bunch of his grad students. And while it has evolved continuously since that time, that same initial research culture just permeates everything that happens on the research side or really at Alpha Simplex as a whole. Alpha Simplex is a research group. If you think about what the brand, I suppose, Alpha Simplex means today, it's, well, technology leveraged investing, it's adaptive markets per Andrew's uh, paper per, per his theory, but really what it is, it's an organization that pushes to try to squeeze the most out of the ideas and try to constantly build in that adaptation to the models and to the portfolios that we create. 
And Rob, you guys are sitting right there in Kendall Square, at, at sort of in the heart of data science. So you can definitely say, does that is that something that runs in your your blood right there? It's sort of you can feel it in the air, the the technology, the the research. Yes. So if you look out at our offices uh, in Kendall Square, you know we're across the street from Google and Microsoft and Facebook and Amazon and the rest of that tech space, and we look right down on MIT campus, and we joke that the reason why we're right there, along with everyone else, is to capture the young. If you look at our research team, and no, we're not all from MIT. I happen to be uh, from the, that school down the road. Each person comes from a different background. So my background is in statistics. Before data science became the hype word that it is today, I have colleagues who are in computer science and decision theory and biostatistics. And we've brought all of us together really to try to, to take different perspectives on the challenge that is financial markets without a lot of the predispositions, without anywhere near the kind of emphasis on the efficient markets hypothesis that might have occurred if we all were finance majors or econometricians. And I would say that that being right next to MIT, that engineering focus is, you know, again, a critical part of the culture at Alpha Simplex. So Rob, you've been with Alpha Simplex since before they launched a uh, managed futures type product and really has grown to be a large player in the managed future space. What are some of the lessons you've learned along the way? And give us a little detail into how this experience has been starting from over the last decade or so of time you've been working in the managed future space. You're absolutely right. So when we launched the Managed Futures Fund, we tried to take a bit of a different tack than many who had already been in the space. And of course, we didn't have many of the advantages of some of the more established players. Now, we launched our Managed Futures program in 2010, you know, the better part of two decades, if not more, after kind of the, the first guard in the space. There were some benefits to that, in so much that futures were a more developed market, that the number of contracts available was much larger, that the liquidity was much more available, that the tools for execution were much, much more developed than were present at that time. We also had the benefit that our infrastructure could be much more modern because we didn't have many of those legacy problems that larger, older institutions might have. But we also didn't have, we also had some weaknesses. The weaknesses being none of us had worked at a CTA before. None of us had the background that uh, kind of spawned uh, all of the, the, the later firms that came out of AHL or Campbell or the like. And so as a result, we had to learn some of those lessons for the first time. If you look back to our own strategy, there were times where we did very well, and there were some times that instead of having those earnings, we had learnings. And as we go on, I'd be happy to go into those. But they, what they really came down to was how do you think about markets? What are your assumptions about how markets behave? And specifically, what are your assumptions about how markets interact? And I think that as we grew our portfolio, as they became more diversified, as we gained greater confidence in letting the signals drive that risk allocation, rather than necessarily imposing a risk allocation upon the product, we were able to create a much more productive and, and much more robust system as a whole. But as I said before, a lot of those lessons were learned the hard way. Before we jump into some of maybe the, 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 the further background that, that uh, I'm sure Katie might have some, some, some questions about, I'm, I'm also interested to allow people to get to you, to know you a little bit better. So one of the things that I often talk to uh, to my guests about is, you know, is there something that, you know, people might not know about you, some kind of hidden talent? I, I've heard the, the word ballroom a couple of times. I mean, I don't know, but I'm, I'm kind of interested if, you know, that it's not all math and stats, but, you know, what's, what's the person, what's the person Rob like when he's not in the office? So I'm a bit old fashioned, I suppose. I, as I said, I, my wife and I met on the ballroom dance team. We still go out swing dancing and salsa dancing when we can steal away from our kids. Though with two of them and both of them being pretty young, that's much less time than we ever thought beforehand. You know, I, I'm a big outdoorsman. I love hiking, mountain climbing, a little bit of biking, though I'll be, again, frank, that's mostly commuting these days. I'm also very much of a do-it-yourself kind of guy. We just finished, you know, probably the one of those formative mistakes of, of every uh, man's life, which is to remodel a house. And 
I ended up doing much more of that myself than I ever intended. But that's something I love. It was the type of thing where you know, I'd go in every day, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd put in an hour painting a room or changing some plumbing, then go into the office, do the research, work with the markets during the day, and then come back, spend the time with the family, put the kids to sleep, give them their baths, and then I'd be back fixing the next part of the house. So that would be another part that, you know, it's probably not worth my time in an economic sense, but it's something that gives me great joy. Maybe we can also turn back to adaptive markets, because I think this is something that specifically Elvis Simplex focuses a lot on. And, and maybe you could give us a little bit more background on how you, you how you think about adaptive markets and how that runs in your in research process and as well as your investment process. Sure. So when you think of adaptive markets, I, I know you're referencing Andrew's paper and Andrew's theory, which and I don't want to take any credit away from that. It's it's a tremendous theory. It's a very comprehensive and cohesive view as to how you can bridge efficient markets and behavioral economics. But at its core, what, you're, what it's really describing is that markets are mostly efficient, but it's composed of agents. It's composed of not perfectly rational, but most of the time pretty close to rational beings that have different objectives and different focuses, different points of attention. And one of the clear outcomes of that model of the universe, especially if you add in random shocks, which I think we all agree occur, though some would argue about the randomness, and we can hit that later. When you build a, a, and you build a, a model of the world of that variety, you quickly realize two things. One, you will never capture all of the factors, all of the drivers, all of the sources of impetus that are driving the individual actors of the markets. And that two, as time goes on, those agents, those people, those traders, those human beings interacting are going to learn. And so the things that have worked in the past are not necessarily going to work in the future. And they certainly will vary over time in terms of how successful they will be. And that has direct relevance to the success of investment strategies. Because if you think about any source of return, that source of return, if it's not simply a compensation for risk, is going to be balanced by two things. One, what is the long-term expectation of whatever premium you're trying to capture? And two, how many other people are trying to go for it? How many other people are trying to supply the market with that hedge, with that source of liquidity? And so as a result, as more people pay attention to those, the opportunity declines. As more people forget about it or view it as a, anathema, view it as a, a, an uncompensated risk, the, less, the more attractive it actually will be. And so when you build your portfolios, you want to make sure that one, whatever you do can adjust to those changes. And two, when you build those portfolios, chances are the people designing them aren't going to be any more able to adjust and adapt to those portfolios than any other person in the market. Otherwise, to think otherwise would be a little bit arrogant, in my opinion. And so you want to make it so that your portfolios, your models can make those adaptations themselves in a way that is, of course, consistent with the mandate of whatever the investment is, but also eminently transparent so you can make sure that indeed it's doing what it's supposed to do, that the models, that the algorithms, however you want to describe it, are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's how we view the adaptive markets hypothesis. It's one, one part of view of how the markets work and another part of view of how should you participate in such a market. So maybe perhaps you could go a little bit more practical and tell us a little bit more about ways that you can actually implement this. Are there, are there certain things that you think are particularly important for being adaptive or are certain certain techniques or certain certain approaches that you have adopted to help follow that view? So you can answer that question a bunch of ways. And I, I think in our portfolios, we try to do it at multiple levels. I'll give you just three quick examples. So one, the product that we're best known for at Alpha Simplex, at least for now, is our trend following fund, our trend following program. And one of the unique things about trend following, as I know you've discussed many, many times before on this program, is that trend following has a few advantages. It's 
broadly diversified. It's, if you're doing it, in my opinion, correctly, it's fairly risk managed. And that it will, in effect, detect the changes in the market, the dislocations in the market, and have a certain, in an abstract sense, likelihood of capturing a pro- or, or potentially providing a return based on that movement. If you think about what momentum really is, though, that there isn't a fundamental premia that is being captured by momentum. It's not like carry. It's not like value where you can at least quantify something. And maybe maybe the quantified carry or the quantified value component doesn't directly or linearly or even it may be even inversely related to the return that you capture in the next period. But but you do have in in some sense a quantity that you're trying to capture. It is something specific that you're detecting. In the case of momentum, you don't know what's causing the momentum. You, you, uh, yeah, we like to try to think of these reasons. We like to try to build some intuition as to why you know, the Mexican peso is moving so-and-so or the U.S. dollar is moving in some direction or, or gold is going up or down because that gives us greater confidence in, in what the signal is. It makes us feel like we better understand our systems. It allows us to create a narrative. But momentum doesn't require us to know that narrative. Momentum doesn't require us to have that insight. It's a generic in a mathematical sense, it's a weak detector. It's a weak learner. And in doing so, it gives us a modest degree of capturing any particular feature, even if we don't know what that feature is, or that factor is, or what that event is ahead of time. So that's the first way you can think about how we go about managing this adaptiveness in a very, very coarse, cursory way at Alpha Simplex. It's by allowing investors to have access to momentum at what we think of as a very cost-effective format. And I won't go any further than that for compliance reasons. The second aspect is how do we follow that momentum? How do we build those signals? How do we make those detect or apply that detection? And so there there are, when you're asking formulation, again, there are two different sleeves or two different paths that you can take. One is you can be very broadly diversified. And I'm not just talking about across assets or across trend horizons, which, I'm, again, I'm sure you've been spoken at length before on, on this podcast, but also approach. Different trend models, be it a simple moving average or a breakout model or a dual moving average crossover or something more exotic like a synthetic option straddle, they all behave in general like momentum, like trend. But they all behave differently at different points in time based on differences in their definitions. They have different emphases on very short-term behavior. So um, a simple moving average cares just as much about the return yesterday as it cares about the return a year ago on that day. A dual moving average crossover really doesn't have much weight at all on what happened yesterday. It cares a lot about what happened at the particular moving average horizon. So if it's a 20-day versus a 100-day, it cares a lot about what happened 20 days ago. And so those differences in definition lead to different outcomes. And so if you're going through a market that has a lot of mean reversion to it, maybe a dual moving average crossover is the way to go. But if you're going through an environment that is very trendy, then a simple moving average might be the best way to go, or even an exponentially weighted process, which cares a lot about what happened yesterday and very little about what happened in the past. The trick is you never know ahead of time which of those is going to be more successful. And so one way you can go about that problem is to combine the methodologies to take a diversified approach to take a weighted combination of those mechanisms. Another thing you can do is to try to build into your algorithms some ability of saying, actually, right now, I should be very reactive or I should be very conservative. I should be very, very tolerant of short-term noise. The trick, of course, is how do you do that? In trend following, you can say, well, there are only a few things that vary between managers one of the big ones is how do you relatively weight the trends that you see? Well, a lot of that comes down to what is that function? And one of the ways that we think we add value is to add some dynamism to that, to try to learn from the data what that weighting is and to allow our algorithms, to allow our systems to change over time in the lessons that they learn and in the functional response, the amount of weight that we give for a given signal. Now, let me add a thousand caveats here. Like, there are some really, really great ways to lose money by trying to highlight or trying to overfit a historical period. Like, a a really simple mechanism to try to really hone in on what worked really well in a situation like today 
would be to go back in time and to find the five or the 10 or the 50 days that looked most like today under some feature set and to do exactly what was the optimal thing to do on those days in the past. I would be willing to bet you a fair amount of money that the you'd have two outcomes. One, your variation of positions would be huge. Your transaction costs would be huge. Your turnover would be monstrous. And you'd lose as a result. Maybe the signal might have a little bit of alpha. Probably not. It's probably all statistical noise. But you will have cost. That is, that is known. That is a given. On the other side, you could not try to make any of these decisions. You could just take that diversified approach that I was talking about before. We think the optimal answer is somewhere in between. And the trick is for us to figure out how adaptive our models should be, how specific by market they should be, and how, more specifically, how can we let our models shape themselves to each market and shape themselves to changes over time to best capture that return. And that, if I were to describe anything, is where we spend a majority of our time and majority of our effort, at least from an algorithm design perspective, in terms of adding value within our managed futures program. That's what we mean by adapt adaptation. Diversification, but also trying to hone in on how do we make that balance between overfit but perfectly matched and overly generalized. Rob, not to use the, the common buzzword in our, our field, but it sounds like you're using in adaptive that you may be using some machine learning type approaches. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? And what is your background with machine learning and how do you think about it in this space? When So it's absolutely machine learning. And I think you're right that machine learning is this incredible buzzword today. Uh, and for many people, it's not something that they really ran into more than a year or two ago. My background is in statistics. My background is in statistics, and I got my degree in statistics back before statistics was a sexy field. When I was an undergrad, I was one of two statisticians in the field. I had a faculty-teacher ratio of one to five, one being the undergrad, five being the faculty. That's actually why I went into statistics, truth be told. In statistics, in machine learning, in decision theory, many of these concepts that are talked about actually got their start in, in the 70s, in the 60s, even in the 50s, where a lot of the nuance has come today or where a lot of the excitement has come today is in where and how they're applied, in what data sets they're applied to, and to what degree you can automate and systematize the application of these tools. Machine learning is a toolbox. To say we use machine learning to, to build our algorithms is kind of like saying, I use tools to build a house. It's not really additive in terms of your understanding. So let me break that down. Let, let's, let's talk about what actually we do with machine learning. And before we go into it, go into the tools that we use, which I think are really interesting, let me also break down to the problems that we try to solve. Because I think there's a lot of hype about machine learning, and I think that there are some kinds of problems where there's a lot of potential for growth. And I think that there's some kinds of problems that regardless of the amount of machinery that you throw at them are still going to be a challenge and are still going to be a source of where people who are, are, are well-versed in the machines and specifically their limitations will be able to still add value as humans rather than just automatons. So when we think about machine learning, I would say that there are two kinds of problems. You have what you could think of as classification problems, or as what I like to call as stationary problems, meaning that the problem that you're working on doesn't change over time. Great example. Google has come out with a lot of, of really interesting results and a lot of really impressive fast algorithms for identifying various things in, in videos and images. Like, you go back 10 years and it was a really hard thing to identify a cat in a photo. Now it's a really trivial thing. In fact, you can do that for arbitrary objects, and you can just go online, and there are online classifiers that allow you to make these decisions. One of the very, very early uses of these things were in financial markets were things like counting cars in parking lots or identifying cars in parking lots or identifying the levels of, of oil in, in silos or, or trying to predict crop yields, things like these. Those kinds of questions – 
where it doesn't matter how many people are looking at the field to identify if is this is going to be a, a good forecast or a bad forecast, or going to be a, a high yield crop or a low yield crop. That doesn't change the success of, of detection of that yield. It doesn't matter how many people are looking at whether or not that's a cat in, in the video or a cat in the image. That doesn't change your success rate. That's a static problem. And the more data you can throw at it, the more training samples that you can throw at the problem, the better your algorithm will be up to some asymptotic. What are the challenges there? Well, the challenges there are abundance of features. You know, the more things you know about, potentially know about a data set, the harder it is to glean what's true. Also noise. The more noisy a data set, the more, the more pixelated an image, for example, the harder it's going to be to get your answer. But again, the more data that you have, the more training samples you have, the better your algorithm will be in the end. There's a second kind of problem. And that's unfortunately the problem that we typically have in trying to forecast financial markets. So again, in the first case that you can do machine learning for yield discovery, you can do it for forecasting earnings, you can do it for trying to predict the number of SKUs that will be sold by a retailer. Those are all great things. Those are all classification problems. Those are all stationary. But when you start trying to answer the question, well, this earnings level and this book value and this momentum indicator and this sentiment out of the CEO on his earnings call, what does that mean about the return that's going to happen between today and tomorrow? That's a much harder question because there's a feedback loop. The more people trying to answer that question and the better their answer is, the less relevant it is in figuring out where it's going to go tomorrow. That is to say, the solution to the problem, the more people looking at the problem, make that problem harder and may make the features that you used to think were useful in making your prediction no longer useful because they've been fully priced in. And so as a result, you have this, this competition, this, this, this fight to be first, this fight to be right among lots of intelligent people in the market is going to make something that means that whatever you design for the second kind of problem, this forecasting problem, is going to disappear over time. And so it may have been that in the past, you know, simple value signals or, or, or value pricing in, in equities may have been very successful at, price, at determining the, the direction of markets. Or a more uh, concrete example, if you were to go back to the 80s and 90s, simply knowing which direction the price moved over the last five days or 10 days was a really good indication of where price was going to move over the next five days. It was, you know, a sharp two or sharp three strategy, depending on how good your transaction costs were. That simply isn't the case anymore. And so the balance that we have to fight is because of the second category of problem. It's whatever we think we know may work for some time, but then that will decay. As more people figure out the things that we figured out, even if we did have forecasting power before, we may not have forecasting power tomorrow. And it's a, so it's not just model overfit. You, there are lots of problems with model overfit, especially in noisy data like financial data. But it's also model decay. And it's this evolution of market participants that will make things that used to work cease to work. At the same time, if people stop paying attention to these particular features, things that used to not work may also start to work again. But that's the challenge that we see today. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's very, very interesting, actually, field, and, and not a field I know a lot about, I have to uh, admit, but I kind of posed the same question a few months ago when I was interviewing the founders of of AHL, and, and to my surprise, both uh, David Harding and Marty Lurik, and, and I think Mike Adam uh, as well, actually, they... They, they didn't sound sort of too overly enthusiastic about sort of artificial and intelligence. And actually, to some extent, from, from memory, they were talking about, well, in a sense, we, we already have that because each of our brains, each participant in the market, you know, kind of makes up that, you know, uh, structure. And, 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 and to break it down in a very simple way for me is, of course, that I think of it uh, as the more the machines, the more examples it, it sees, it kind of, it, it, it learns more and more, but it learns more and more from, from what's happening, you know, in the recent history. And we know that things constantly change and might even go back. You know, we don't have this kind of data from 50 or 100 years ago, but actually to some extent you could argue that markets go back 
and replicate themselves into how things worked 50 or 100 years ago. It doesn't always have to be new change. It could be changed back to the way it were. So how do you overcome all of that? How do you make it work? <laughs> I, I would actually agree with them to a large extent. I think that, as I gave with that example, I think that you can very easily overdo it mm. with machine learning. I think you can very easily overfit yeah. your process. And that overfitting can come from just finding noise and thinking it's signal, or it can come from decaying of these at attributes. Right. And the things that we're detecting, the things that we're allowing our models to adjust to, are generally fairly slow-moving features. These are not things that are going to change from one month to the next. These are features that are going to develop and disappear over the course of years. Anything shorter than that, and we have no hope of detecting and having any sense of confidence in it. The difference is, the way we design our models is that we design them so that they can, those algorithms can, shape those particular nuances between markets, but that they have a common structure and have common constraints and common features across markets that we know, in some sense, hold economic value or have some economic truth to them. So again, putting my, my statisticians hat on, my, building my, my model builders hat on, when you have an infinitely wide dimensional uh, feature space, you know, anything can go into to forecasting any market, potentially, and you have only so much data. You know, suppose we have 40 years of data. Well, congratulations, you have 10,000 data points on a daily basis. And yes, you could chop it up second to second or minute to minute, but for most of the things we're talking about, especially for momentum and trend following, it's not going to be additive. It's the autocorrelation is too high of the signal. So how do you deal with that problem? You deal with that problem by building structure. You deal with that problem by saying, you know what, my learning models, my mechanisms, they can only learn a certain class of problem. They can only learn... Within trend following, how do I relatively weight my different horizons? That they can never go short a trend. That they can never give too much emphasis to a trend. That the kinds of lessons that they can extract are in actually a very, very narrow region of that unlimited space. Because otherwise, I can guarantee you, you'll pick up noise. An apocryphal story probably apocryphal, it very well may be true, told to me by Andy Gelman of Columbia, was that when either he was a grad student or uh, when he was an early professor, he had a student try to find the single best predictor of the S&P 500. And what the student came back with after studying thousands and tens of thousands of databases was the quarterly price of butter in Bangladesh. And indeed, over the in-sample period, it would have phenomenally high uh, R-squared. And on an out-of-sample basis, it was worthless. And the only way you can avoid those kinds of instances, besides model discipline, is by adding structure to your model, by knowing what kinds of features you can input, by knowing how those inputs can be used to develop that function, to develop that model, and what form the output will be. And that's where the art, so to speak, comes from. And we're, the only difference between what we do and what, you know, Harding did and AHL did back in the day was that we've tried to make it so that the algorithms add much of that asset by asset or asset class by asset class nuance. And, and we parameterize how they learn rather than trying to code and tune every asset on an item by item basis. And why do we do that? Again, because if we have two or three parameters that allow us to figure out or to constrain how 70 or 80 markets are learning, are, are being detected, are, are, are following trends, well, we're going to be much less likely to overfit our process. We're going to be much less likely to overfit those parameters than if we have to fit 80 different markets so, or, or 270 or 200, I guess 240 different parameters for 80 markets. And so by narrowing that, we're actually taking advantage of these tools and of the systems and of the computation to make our jobs as models that much easier and that much more possible. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. 
We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.